I know this is you guys are volunteering your time because you want to improve as an official and more specifically improve in the area of communication. And that's exactly what you're going to do tonight. You know, I recently gave this presentation um, at my local board um, meeting, um, but it was only 15 minutes. So I really crammed it in and I basically just read off the list. I mean, it was packed with a lot of content, but I know this session is one to two hours like minimum it's probably even more than that this is just an endless topic for us to to kind of go down so i'm happy that we have an hour and a half to really go deep tonight um so i think this is the perfect form format to be able to um share this content with you so tonight you're going to learn about the mental and and emotional approach to to working with coaches and just being a um a high level communicator on the court, and also more specifically, the most effective ways to communicate with coaches. So we're gonna speak a lot in the macro, the big picture, but then we're gonna go very narrow and very specific with how to use these tools and when to use them and when to say it. Um, like I said before, if anyone has any questions, put it through the chat. Brian, if you could pay attention to that chat, cause I'll be zoning out and have no uh, idea who's asking questions. So if you could help me out their partner um and i think you know if, if you guys want to take some notes maybe some things that stand out to you i think that'll be equally as beneficial for you so before i get into the rapid response presentation let me just talk about a couple prerequisites that we need to have before we even step on the court and and are able to communicate effectively right it, number one is play calling these responses are great but if we're getting plays wrong it's not going to matter you know, your decision making on the court, your accuracy, your level of accuracy, that's going to be completely related to how you communicate and and how coaches are perceiving you and how often they're engaging on you. If you're messing up plays, they're going to speak more. If you're more accurate, they're going to speak less. That's a math game right there. Your signals, having strong, presentable, professional, sharp signals is another way to decrease the amount of times they come to you. Just because you have good signals does not mean they're not going to argue a call and tell you you're bad, but it's just a small factor that's going to contribute to, you know, making them move on quicker or not even engaging with you. Your hustle, your positioning, that's inexcusable, really. If we're not hustling and getting into position, then the coach has total leverage and we're in the wrong. So that's not something that we can do mechanics and coverage if we're calling out of our primary if we're calling from 40 feet away it's going to wake people up and make them question us so being strong in those areas having core presence core presence is a lot of different things it's um your posture your demeanor your appearance uh the way you run the way you stand the way you um communicate the way you use your words the way you you know it's it's a lot of things built in your core presence. So having a strong core presence is going to decrease the amount of explanations you have to give. And I'm super big on mental toughness, right? Being emotion, being mentally strong and also being emotionally intelligent. So if we can kind of uh, have these six prerequisites down, um, it's going to help our game and it's going to help our, our communication. So I'm going to, I'm going to screen share with you now. And um, we're going to put together a little pack for everybody. Ryan, do we have like an, an email chain of everyone on the call tonight? Did you receive that info? Paul, okay. most, of the, most of the people that are on from um, Wisconsin, I'll have email addresses through the lens of the three associations. So I can send out anything you send me as a PDF or an cool. attachment. I'll be able to send out. So I just want to make sure everybody tonight gets the presentation. It's a PDF doc. I think it'll be super helpful for you to have as your own. Um, so two main reasons real quick, why we struggle with coaches. Number one, I think there's a huge lack of education, a lack of effective education and a lack of, you know, teaching specific ways how to communicate. I went to a lot of camps and um, at camps, I got to say, Roger Ayers does a great job. He has a couple segments. He has a communication with coaches segment. Uh, communication. Hello, I'm Dr. Watson. I'm Lieutenant Grissom, British South African Police. Station Victoria Falls. Block, he's Martin. blocking my shot. All right, there we go. Good. Um, so Roger Ayers does a great job at his camp. Communication with partners, communication with players, communication with coaches. So I would say, you know, he does a fantastic job providing education in that area. 
but besides that, everything I've received now, I've received chunks here and there, and I've learned, I've learned a lot, I'm not, but as a whole, we don't address this issue. We do not get specific on how we should communicate with coaches. So there's a big education gap and I'm happy to provide that. And Crown Refs is working hard at, you know, creating a system. And I think that's what rapid responses is. It's a system. It's a proven tried and true system of 10 years of me failing and succeeding and, uh, and observing what works and really analyzing it. This is something I like to do. I, I love talking about being a better communicator. Um, I love talking about game management and different ways to, to handle the coach. So um, we're happy to be putting in that work. Number two, and this is probably, well, it's, it's equally as important of a reason why we struggle with coaches. There's a big fear factor. Oh my God, it's in every locker room on all levels from division one all the way down to the lower levels. There's a fear built into officiating, officials have it. I, mean, I don't know if it was passed down from generations. Maybe it's the culture has has created that for us, but we, we are scared of coaches for the most part. I'm not saying everybody is, um, but most, most, most officials are at least to some degree. And the fear is a fear of us losing games, financial, right? Fear of getting a bad rating fear of getting yelled at most humans don't like to get yelled at so there's a natural built-in fear of that there's a fear of someone openly disagreeing with your decisions we're out here getting paid to make decisions and we naturally don't like when people disagree with our decisions and there's a fear of getting a call from an assigner so if we can eliminate all of these fears and do what's best for the game it's going to help you guys so much um, so I just think it's important to just put that out there, the fear word, and know it's there. And I think by putting it out there, we can begin to to improve on that and start to eliminate it. So let's get into the presentation. So rapid responses is basically our system that we built to be able to run the game and not let the game run you, to be able to run every conversation, to be able to provide a professional and effective response to anything a coach will ever say to you. Basically, we mapped out all of the different things that coach, coaches say to us. There's really only 10 to 15 things that they say in 3,000 different ways. How is that a foul? The foul count is seven to two. Why did your partner call that from over there? You guys gotta be consistent. We've all heard this, right? And there's, there's new things they say, but I wanna get you guys to the point where there's nothing a coach can say to you where you're, you're just stumped because you have it, you have an answer in your pocket. So these rapid responses are almost like stock answers that you contextualize based on that interaction you're having. So rapid responses are strategies and tactical tips to help you communicate and manage coaches more effectively. Purpose, um, you know, th listen, I'm, I'm, I try to give back in a lot of different ways to officiating and a couple of years into my journey, I started paying attention to the officiating shortage. It's not something I thought about the first year making content, but as I interacted with more and learned more about the overall infrastructure of the industry, I started to see these stats. And then I started to, to work towards putting out sportsmanship content and content that raised awareness on, on what's going on. As we know, 70% of new officials are quitting after three years due to abuse from coaches and fans. And the sportsmanship and respect for officials has been poor for generations since you've been a kid, since, <laughs> since black and white TV. Um, officials desperately need a new set of tools that will restore the respect back in the game. These are the, the new set of tools. I, I truly believe that. This training is going to help you reapply the pressure back onto the coaches, and it's going to arm you with proven methods that are tried and true. I would never share anything that did not work for me. So everything I'm sharing has worked multiple times. And, you know, so many people have hit me up about the effectiveness and how they're actually feeling a difference on the court. They have more control. They feel like they have a little bit more power, more tools. So I'll, that, that part of it is great. But there's a lot of people that have never even heard of rapid responses. There's a lot of people that are, you know, big Crown Refs fans that I say on, on calls. I'm like, oh, have you heard our rapid response series? No, what's that? So I have to continue to push this and push this. And I, and I feel like if every basketball official in the country were to have this training, sportsmanship would improve overnight. The shortage would improve overnight. Um, a lot of the culture would improve. So we're just playing our part here. Um, 
just trying to impact one official at a time. So this is a 10 part series. What you guys are seeing is all the covers of our previous podcasts. So there's 10 episodes out. Um, 10 of them are available on Patreon, but there's four available publicly on Spotify and Apple Music. Um, so I definitely recommend listening to these in addition to, to tonight. As you can see, we have some not nice coaches on the cover. But those are the coaches that I want to work with. Those are the coaches I want to see at my game. And again, that's not, we don't, you don't have a fear. We should not have a fear of that. There's a lot of refs that look at some of these coaches and say, oh, I would never want to work with him. I want you guys to all want that. So before we get into the tactics of what you're going to say and when and how to say it, I believe there's, um, you know, best practices and approaches that we should have sort of like just mental approaches, things we should have already have established before we get into the conversation. So these are 20 mindset tips before we enter the conversation. So use these strategies and approaches as a baseline of knowledge that will help guide your conversations and interactions with the coaches to help you run the game. So first mindset tip, establishing a professional relationship. I see so many officials that are establishing a personal relationship. They want to speak about how their season's going. They want to ask about their family. They want to ask, uh, how'd your back surgery go? Uh, all these things that have nothing to do with the game. Now, these are nice things to say off of the basketball court and things I would tell you to say. I always tell people to ask about their family, but not in this setting and not on the basketball court right before a game. We should not be speaking to coaches before the game, um, like during layup lines. We go over and speak and, and wish them good luck, right? We shake the visiting coach's hand, then we shake the head coach's hand. Although in high school, I know with COVID, they've changed a little bit of that. But when you are, you know, just when you are going up to the coach, just shake their hand, give them a smile, look them in the eyes, tell them good luck, have a great game, whatever you want to tell them, but make it short and sweet. And I remember a game this year, I, w I went out and I was the third official in line to go speak to, to go shake the coach's hand. First official, daps him up, hugs him up. How you doing? How's your back, sir? You feeling good? How's every, oh, you, yeah, you're getting back on the court. I know, I know. Yeah. yeah, have a great game, all right? It was like a seven second hug interaction. Next person goes up. How you doing? Good. Let's have a great game. Let's have a great game. Gives them basically a hug. I just go up. How you doing? Coach, good luck. Kept my distance about five feet from him. Gave him the long handshake. I'm not going to go up and give you a hug before the game. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't know you that well, and it's just not a proper setting. The reason why is three minutes into the game, the two, co the two refs that hugged the coach are getting screamed at. So it's, if this if that strategy worked, I would say, let's go do it. Yeah, hug them. Ask them how their season is. But it doesn't work. They respect you less. When you're getting personal, that's leverage for them. So I would just keep it professional, keep it business-like. You're not going up there mean. But I'm letting the coach know I am all about business. I'm not here to joke around with you, although I love joking, and I could probably joke around better than you. I'm not here to do it tonight. Humor is good to use if it's the right spot. Um, so I will say, you know, use that as a, as a strategy every once in a while. But so the, just the main point is just professionalism over personal relationship. Here's number two is one that uh, I'm sure a lot of officials in their pregame are not following. So hopefully this can be kind of a turning point. Don't judge the coach for previous behavior. And that's whether positive or negative doesn't matter how the coach has, has acted in previous games. If they got seven technicals in seven games, it's irrelevant. If they were the nicest coach ever for seven straight games, that's irrelevant. And when I got onto this, when I started having kind of connecting these dots was last year during a regular season game, we were in the locker room for a pregame. And my partners are basically just predicting how the game is going to go, which I tell all my officials we should not be making any predictions about the teams, about the players, about the standings, about what they're going to run. It's all kind of productive, and it's not ref content for me. So back to um, not judging the coach and being in the locker room for this pregame. So I hear the R. He's just saying, all right, the coach of Team A, he's a real handful. He's, you know, we're going to have to manage him. He likes to get mad and animated and shouts. I'm like, okay, all right, we'll manage that. If we see it, we'll be ready for it. Coach of Team A, sweetheart. He's never going to say a word to you. Oh, like this guy, Frank, this guy, Frank, he's the best. He's the best. Okay. 
So we go into the game. What happens? Exact opposite. Frank was not kind and got teed up by me because he said that was horrible about three times to an obvious charge call. Um, and then the coach of Team B was an angel. Didn't say a word all night. Didn't say a word. So I'm like, why are we even pr- making these predictions in the pregame? They're not going to play out the way we think they are. So the mo- the best approach, the most simplistic approach for us is to just go in with a blank slate. And that may be hard for you guys to like swallow your pride. I know you've had this one coach for 17 years and he's never been nice. But if you can get yourself to the point where you've eliminated that and you've erased that memory, that history, it's going to help you manage much easier. It's not going to weigh you down or act as a crutch. And then conversely, the nice coach, the nice coach will will turn on you. And if you just put him in that, um, if you put him in a file of he's the nice coach forever, it's going to backfire on you. So simple, stay in the middle. Don't judge the coach for their previous behavior. Don't try to convince the coach that your call is correct. We see a lot of officials getting in trouble because they tr- just trying to convince the coach or prove to the coach that their call was right. And all it does is create a back and forth. It creates debate language. When I enter my conversations, I'm not there to have any kind of debates. As soon as it turns into a debate or back and forth, I'm out. I'm, I'm exiting. So, it, so that's, that's another observation I've had is, uh, is not trying to prove to the coach. So just think about that when you're giving the coach a response. Make sure you're just giving a rule-based explanation of what you saw and you're not trying to make him like agree or believe you. You obviously want to want to provide something that's that's very effective and you walk away from that conversation and not have any issues, but you're not at the end of the day you're not trying to sell the coach on the call verbally. Number 4, is stop treating the coach like your boss. This kind of gets back to the fear factor. I think a lot of officials, the dynamic between the coach and the ref is you think they're your boss. They're not our bosses. They're, we're equals in the game. We're equals in the game. Another uh, analogy I use is like the waiter versus the angry customer at the restaurant. You know, the angry customer, they don't like it because there's a stain on their glass. You know, they're, they're, silverware has some marks on it their food is cold and they get mad at the waiter and what does the waiter do the waiter's just there to service that and apologize and say i'm sorry and basically just run around uh and do whatever the customer wants the coach is not our customer we're we're not there to serve the coach we're there to serve the game and the game is above everybody number five is a home run this is something that you guys should incorporate and i think there's a lot that you can incorporate into your pregame, but this is just a bullet that should be in every pregame. What we permit, we promote. If we allow it to happen, it's our fault, and it's just going to continue to happen if we don't address it. Anytime we've, you know, we walk away from the court a lot, uh, at least in my 10 years, I've walked away from the court saying, oh, man, that coach just didn't didn't stop tonight, or he was out of control, or Man, we should have teed him up. This is all my fault. It's all my fault. I let it all happen. The coach did it, yes, but I didn't penalize it. So we we try to take steps to be proactive and try to limit that from happening. But at the end of the day, if it happens and we don't address it, it's our fault. So what we permit, we promote. Uh, This year, I've taken a real, I've turned the real corner on really enforcing sportsmanship and being consistent in all of my conversations. I'm repeating myself. I'm on repeat. I only have a couple couple topics that I'm talking about. Sportsmanship is the number one topic. It's it's not the play calling explanation. Yes, I get to that, but once I'm done with that, now it's my turn to go on offense and talk about sportsmanship. So, I would uh, you know, and I'll get into a little bit more about ways I've been firm and I'll get in I'll talk about some conversations I've had recently with coaches. Uh, Number six, the best time to approach a coach is after a timeout. So let's say a pattern is developing of a coach refereeing from the bench multiple times, meaning, oh, that's a travel. That's a foul. Uh, Once it becomes a pattern, now we have to address it. The pattern is two, I think, right? Or two two or three times. If if you're letting it happen more than that, you're, you're, you're permitting it. Once a coach shouts onto the court more than once, has to be addressed a lot of officials don't know when to do it 
Paul, I didn't have time. Yes, you did. You didn't create time. You could have gotten to him during a dead ball. You could have stopped the game or you could have held up the game during a, during an out of bounds play or a foul and walked over to the coach. I, I've, I've held up the game this year. You know, I have the ball. I'm not putting it in until our conversation is done. And I let him know, coach, are, are we clear? And I've even said, coach, I'm not resuming this game until you look me in the eyes and understand what I'm telling you. Cause I had all the leverage right there. I got the game right here. I'm not putting it back in until you understand. Um, but if you don't have those times during a dead ball, uh, they all call timeouts. So once their timeout is done, get to them. You know, their timeout is 60, 75, 90 seconds, depending on what they call, 30 second timeout. So regardless of the length of their timeout, once their timeout is done, they've coached their team. They have no juice left. They have no energy left to then go at you. They're, they're in a much different state of mind, much more calm and relaxed state of mind where you can just penetrate them with a message. So get to them after a timeout if you see any negative trends developing in the game. And the earlier, the better. We respond to respectful questions all the time. I love when coaches ask respectful questions. That means they want to talk plays and that means they want to learn about that. That's easy. We should respond to that all the time. If you're not responding to respectful questions, that's 100% our fault, and that's going to make the officials look bad, just like kind of being out of position, right? We, there's no excuse for being out of position. If a coach is being kind and asking a question because he wants to know, we got to answer them if we have time. Um, know which comments to ignore versus to address. This is a big skill set to have. You know, you hear officials say only respond to um, – questions right and that's a strategy that we can use but that's not our whole approach it can't be our whole approach we got to know which to ignore which comments don't mean anything we're just going to let that evaporate in the air and then which comments are sticking and, and what we need to address you know and just kind of um appraising what they say and and running it through your sportsmanship filter or your respect filter is this respectful? Do I need to address what he just said? Do I need to address those comments? Or do these comments really just mean nothing? He's just talking into the air. He's really not even talking to me. And that's just that's just awareness, game awareness, self-awareness. Uh, maintain strong eye contact. Very simple, right? But not a lot of officials do it the whole time. When I speak to the coach, I'm dead in the eyes the entire conversation. And he, they start looking away now. I want them to start looking away. Because when we start looking away, we lose that core presence. We lose um, that, 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 that strength, that, um, that command. This is something that's been very successful for me. And I can just see the effect it's having. I see the effect it's having on them. They're not comfortable staring at me in the eyes the whole time. So I want you to grill them when you're giving a response. Don't look away for one second. Know the difference, but this is a big one. Know the difference between asking a question versus questioning a call. Asking a question gets back to number seven. We're going to respond to respect, respectful questions. So if they're asking a legit question, we're going to respond. Most of the time, I don't think they're asking a legit question. I think they're questioning your call in, in question form, but it's to disagree and to, for them to share their opinion. It's a fake question in an unsporting way. So if you find that they're questioning your call a lot, that's going to be a different response than if they're just asking a legit question. And once they start to question your call multiple times, now that is something that we can address. Coach, I'm very respectful if you have a question, but you're not really asking me questions. You're just sharing your, your disagreeable opinion. Do you have a question? Brian, I see there's 19 messages in the chats. Anything we want to look at? <clears throat> yeah. Well and Ben asked, um, since you've been using some of these, you know, rapid response techniques, have you increased the number of bench warnings you have? And, and if you have, has that conversely decreased the number of times you've had to use a technical foul because, you know, you're giving bench warnings and they're adhering to that. I think it's a good question. And it probably is one that, you know, I think I've given too many bench warnings when they should have been technical fouls this year. 
that's just my generic answer. But more specifically, how has rapid responses helped me on the court as a communicator? Has it decreased my technical fouls? I think it has. I think it has. I, I see a difference in the way coaches approach me, especially the coaches that kind of know who I am and have had me before. I see a much different approach towards me than the, uh, my partners, to be honest with you. You know, like uh, a coach. Go ahead. What's up? Can you, can you give like a, a standard example and maybe just share with the audience? Like, what's an example of something that you gave a coach a free pass and gave him a warning where you should have, you know, maybe given him a technical foul? Uh, yeah, the other day I called uh, a shooting foul on a three-point shot. Um, I'd like to look at the film if, to see if it was a flop. Um, you know, I, I didn't I didn't get a ch- chance to look at it, but I think, I, you know, at the time I thought it was a foul. I thought he didn't let the shooter land, and he kind of boxed him out too early as he shot the jump shot, so he went down. And the coach thought it was a flop, and he just clapped him. He said, what? Just what? And I immediately went to a warning. But the, the way he did it in the demonstrative tone, like, that's just a technical foul. There's no need to go go to a warning right there. However, I went to a warning, and I didn't hear from him the rest of the game. Let me let me go on. I'll, I'll tell you more about this interaction. So, so I gave him a warning, and he immediately questioned, what? I said, I'm not explaining my warning to you right now. I'm not going to explain my warning to, to you when you just shouted at me. And I put the warning in the book, rotated across. And then at halftime, now I never like talking to coaches at halftime, right? Sometimes it's kind of unavoidable unavoidable because I went to check the books and the coach, of course, walked over. So maybe I should have did a better job just waiting at half court and letting him go to the locker room. But I went to to the books and he's still questioning, how are you going to give me a warning? I said, coach, I'm not going to explain your behavior to you. That's your job to figure out. No, no, you don't understand. How do you, coach, you shouted at me and clapped at me in a close proximity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, coach, we spoke in the pregame about respectful and professional communication. Yeah, I respect you. I said, well, then maybe you need to be more aware about how you're communicating. And that was his dagger. That was, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Won't happen again. Won't happen again. He apologized. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then came out the second half, not a peep. The only thing he said to me was, um, Paul, can I have can I have a timeout? Third, uh, Paul, thirty second, please. Totally changed up his tone, and I went to the locker room. I said, I need to write that line down. The line of coach, you need to be more aware of how you're communicating. I think that is super effective, and I think that basically grabbed him. That grabbed his brain in the moment, and just gave him a an ounce of clarity. Like, oh yeah, you're right. I am not conscious of how I'm speaking because I yell at my kids all the time, and now I'm doing the same thing to the ref, and I can't differentiate. So sometimes they need a little bit of tips and coaching to help, you know, wake them up. So, yes, um, it's definitely improved my game management and my overall amount of interactions. Now, I still have to manage a lot, you know, but I feel like it's a lot less than what uh, it would be if I didn't have these tools. Um, Anything else in the chat, Brian? Um, just one more thing about, you know, holding up the game when you hear coaches say things, you know, like use the word travel and they're doing it multiple times, you know, or you got to call something there. Um, how do you, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. See, this is what rapid response is all about. You just gave me something and I immediately already know how we're going to respond. You got to call something. Okay, coach. I respect that, but I would never tell you which play you need to call. I don't have that kind of audacity. I would never do that to you. That's a two-way street right there. He's telling me what to call, but God, you imagine I went in his huddle during a timeout and told him which play to run? How crazy does that sound? So by saying these these lines to them, it wakes them up and it gives them, it shows them that two-way respect. It shows them the street of two-way respect. Um so yeah uh any what else about holding up the game did i answer the question yeah you did okay bro hug no thanks Ah, ben wisconsin yeah no bro hugs um this is a really really effective concept uh, i learned from al batista it's called use the three voices so every time we communicate on the court you're using one of these three voices 
uh, start with the normal voice, pretty self-explanatory. And that comes usually in the form when coaches are asking legit questions or we're just having uh, like a non-stressful conversation, right? Just a normal voice, pretty, pretty easy. We want to have normal voice conversations. I had a game, I remember I had a stretch of games where I remember saying, yeah, using my normal voice basically all game. The coach was in his, we were in our normal voices all game, which means there was no management going on, which means I didn't have to diffuse or use my authority voice, which are the other two voices. The authority voice is the voice that we're projecting that we're running the game. You may have to use that when you're talking to players, you know, that are um, playing after the whistle or in each other's face, right? You're projecting using your outside voice, but also it helps with coaches now, maybe from a volume perspective, you're not going to project as much with the coach standing right next to you, but you're still speaking in that author authoritative, firm tone when you have to relay a message to them, when you have to get to them after the timeout and, and talk to them about sportsmanship, when they're refereeing multiple times from the bench and you have to go address that. That's my authority voice. I'm not saying every single time I'm, you know, foot on the gas, this is what you need to do, coach but there's definitely a more of a firmness to, to my communication. And then the diffusing is just the calming. We're calming them. I understand. I hear you. You could be right, coach. I, I, if that's what you saw, I respect that. I respect your opinion. Talk to me, coach. What did you see? I'm here. I'm a good listener. I mean, that's an example of all the ways that I diffuse. So that'll help you when you're you're entering the conversation, you know, which voice to use. Understand the difference between offense and defense. Authority is offense, diffusing is defense. Sometimes we gotta play offense, sometimes we gotta play defense. You gotta know when when you're doing one of the other. Sometimes we we do both in the same conversation. Sometimes I lead with the calming and then I have to play offense. Offense doesn't mean I'm shouting at them or, you know. Again, putting my foot on the pedal. Hey, hey, coach, I hear you. You can talk to me, but do me a favor. Please don't shout at us from across the court. Let's keep it professional. So that was an example of me playing, me diffusing and also playing offense because I had to share the proper sportsmanship guidelines. Every unsporting comment is an opportunity to play offense. So you got to keep tally. You got to be aware. You got to have a radar. You know, I was I was working a game the other day and. And I'll talk about this play in a little bit, but um, yeah, I hear the coach shouting, screaming sh multiple times, shouting, shouting, shouting. And, you know, my partners didn't address it. So I had to go up the court and give a technical foul. But these are these are things we need to catalog. They need to pop up on our radar. We can't not hear it. I can't be the only official hearing it. I had a person at the game that, that came to watch and he was deep in the stands and he heard everything. So it's just that awareness and knowing what they say. I know we're not going to be looking at the coach when the play is going on, but we got to feel what's happening on the sideline. Got to hit your radar, <laughs> especially at the volume that they're using. How can, how can you not hear it? Are you that locked into the play that you have no awareness of the coach? We have a hard job. You got to get the play right and you got to handle the benches. So we got to do all that in one, do it all at the same time. Uh, 14, this is just going to switch the tone up a little bit or not the tone, but just to give you a different route of a response is the compliment. You know, we're talking about ways to manage them and to run the game. What about complimenting them? When the coaches are respectful and they ask me a legit question, I love to answer or finish that encounter with, um, hey coach, I really appreciate how respectful you're asking me. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Because we're promoting good behavior. We're, we're promoting respect right there. We're empowering them to do it again. That's almost like, I dare you to do it again. I dare you to be nice again, coach. You're so kind. You're being so respectful. Thank you so much. I had a coach um, who I had to go de-escalate a few years ago. He was shouting, shouting, shouting. So I go over to him to talk to him. Hey, coach, we're very approachable if you have a question, but please stop shouting out to the court. Did you have a question? Yeah, Paul, but I just feel like, you know, we got hit down there and over here, you didn't call it. I didn't even address that, didn't even acknowledge that. I just said, coach, I, the way you're speaking to me now, that's how we need to communicate. Great job. I said, great job to him. And I walked away and I bet you he was scratching his head like, what the hell just happened? What the, that was a mind twist right there. But it worked. 
you know, the compliment worked in that in that spot. So drop them a compliment. Our responses should close doors. So that response I just gave, close the door. You know, we don't want to reopen them. We, uh, you know, you want to get let them get the last word in sometimes. You don't want to walk away while they're, you know, shouting at your back. Once, the, once you're walking away, you want that to be the end of the conversation. You want the door to be closed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we spoke about don't, not talking to the coach during the pregame or at halftime. Just to add to the pregame part, I see officials, they, they go out at halftime and they'll be like, hey, coach, anything? Did you see anything? Anything we missed? Anything we could do better? The coach is not our trainer. The coach is not our coach. So why are we asking that? We're doing that as a fake way to build rapport. But again, he's not going to respect you as much. As as nice as you think it is and you think you're building that rapport, I'm just telling you sustainably long term, it's just not it's not going to help as much as the firm approach that I'm giving you. Ask them questions to reapply the pressure. I'll show you a couple of examples uh, when we get into the responses, but this is just a great way to close the door. Well, actually, I mean, this might not close the door. That might not be correct because you're asking them a question so they can respond back to you. But it's a, just a great way to de-escalate, kind of change the so subject. You're empowering them. You're showing that you're listening. Um, and you're also putting the pressure back on them because a lot of times they're not, they're not fit to answer referee questions. They can't really explain plays with clarity and, and rule-based knowledge. So let's test them. Test them. He asked you about a travel. Paul has a travel. Okay, where was his pivot foot, coach? Which pivot foot? Or my guy's getting held. Which which player? Which number? Oh, I don't know, coach. I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out which player is holding. Can you be specific? Which with which number? So just asking the questions is great, and you could think of a million questions to ask them. Um, one of the most common ones I use is is that fair, or or uh, what did you see? It's pretty simple. But I use that. It's kind of my go-to. What would you see, Coach? Talk to me. Tell me what you saw. We dictate the terms of the dialogue. That means we get to talk about what we want to talk about when. That's up to us. We have that control. Most of the time, we relinquish that duty to the coach, and we let them to dictate the terms of the dialogue. But the ball is in our court to do so. So again, if, if, a, if a trend is developing, if a coach is shouting from across the court, let's go dictate the terms. Coach, we're very approachable, but we're not gonna shout at each other from across the court. I would never do that to you. Plus, we can't have a conversation from 40 feet away. Did you, did you have a question you wanted to ask me? So play offense, let them know the proper way to communicate because they've obviously forgotten. Don't explain your text to your coaches. Don't explain. I really didn't want to explain my warning the other day to, to the to the coach. He kind of got me at halftime, so I had to give him a little bit more. But my initially my response was, how is that a warning? I said, I'm not explaining the, the warning to you after you just shouted at me, and I just left. So, um, and you see, you see co-officials that go try to talk to the coach after you give a warning or after you give um, a technical foul. Stay away. Leave them alone on their own island. Um, you know, I was in a game the other day and, uh, I, coach requested a timeout. I didn't honor, I didn't grant the timeout cause a one had the ball. So I'm running up the court. I said, sorry, coach. Next thing you know, my co-official grants the timeout. So the coach who was right there starts going nuts, starts going nuts. So my partner starts to walk over, but I had already given my warning kind of before my partner went over. So I'm giving a warning, but, 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 but coach has been warned as my other partner is coming over to switch. The warning did not help. He just went, he, he went nuts after that. He kept going and, and, and even raised his volume and his, and his level of, um, you know, being demonstrative. And it should have been a technical foul. I was, I was going to give another technical foul, but I wasn't going to show up my partner because he was literally in the huddle as the coach is waving his arms after the tech. So this, this, what I'm going to tell you, speaks to our level of fear. We get in the locker room and I say, hey, any reason why we didn't give a technical foul to the coach there? He goes, oh, they're down 25. I didn't want to stick it to them. Time and score does not matter. Just because a team is losing by 25, like, I don't know. I think that's very soft. We've gotten very soft with, like, scores. It's just a game. Who cares? It's a game. You lost, you're losing by 25. Who cares? They're 25 points better than you. 
does not mean that you're exempt from a technical foul. So I think that's part of the fear factor into it. He didn't want to do it because he felt guilty that he was showing up the coach or sticking the coach when in fact the coach was showing the whole gym up by his behavior and disrespect for the game. Paul, there's so a don't... question in the chat about um, if you have a technical foul on a player, how do you go about communicating that to the coach versus you have a technical foul on the coach? Obviously, you're not going to go over and explain that to the coach, but a player might be a different. Yeah, I wouldn't. I would never go up to the coach and start a conversation that you don't have to. If they don't ask, I'm not going up to you. A lot of coaches in this situation are not going to legit ask you what they did. They want to complain and disagree with you. For example, the other day, I, I in my pregame, I said, Coach, we're very approachable if you have a question at the right time, but we're, we expect professional and respectful communication. So I gave a coach, I gave his player a technical foul. Now, I thought the whole gym saw it. The player was demonstrative with me, clapping at me, and even said, come on, ref, right in front of his coach. So after I give the technical foul, we shoot the shots. Can I ask what he did? Coach, I said, you can ask your player. You can ask your player. He's right there. You said we can, you said we can ask you a question. So he got me there. I'm like, okay, sure. Coach, I thought your player shouted at me in a demonstrative manner and clapped after he missed a shot. And did it in an unsportsmanlike manner. Okay, thank you for the explanation. So like I was forced there and I've gone the other way with it where I'm just like, I don't really want to give you an explanation. I want you to have a teachable moment with your player and ask your player what he did, but that's not my job. So uh, I would say don't go up to the coach unless they ask. If they ask, you can go over, but also be mindful that when they call you over that they are going to listen to what you're saying and not just in interrupt and um, cut you off and share their opinion. And that's probably my hesitancy with going over to coaches because I've noticed the majority of the times that's how it ends up. So I'm hesitant to go over to a coach for that. So be mindful of that. I'm sure everybody on the call has dealt with that too. You go to tell the coach what he, the player did and now he's arguing with you about another call that's not even applicable. So number 20, be courteous, show class. Have conviction, take charge. Those are the four C's. Um, so let's get into some tactics of what to say. Now, I, I, in red, you'll see these are a lot of very common things we hear. So again, these are take what you like, disregard what you don't. If you see something you like, you want to use it verbatim, use it. If you see something you like and there's elements of it, but you want to subtract something and add your own, do it. You got to be creative. You know, one of the reasons why I'm able to do all this is because I'm in creative mode all the time. And you obviously you can see with how much content I put out. But even with the tactics of of being a good communicator and being a good game manager, you got to you got to be creative. So I encourage everybody on the call to, to find your creativity when it comes to being a ref. So ref, how is that not a foul? Again, these are two simple ways to respond. There's a million other ways, but I listed two two bullets pretty much for each two or three coach i didn't see any illegal contact on the play what exactly did you see so very simple way to respond to a very common thing they say how is that not a foul the key word here is illegal contact that's the rule-based explanation illegal contact don't say yeah i didn't I, it was it was nothing i didn't think it was anything or it's not a foul i mean i've even been guilty of saying that but anytime you can get more rule-based, more specific with what's in the rule book, you're going to have leverage in that conversation and in that response. So, Coach, I didn't see any legal contact on that play. What exactly did you see? That's me putting the pressure back onto the coach. Tell me what you saw. Now we can. Now we have, as we get into the later rounds of this conversation, the coach is losing juice. They're all good in the first round. They can throw a haymaker. A lot of times they miss, but they can throw a haymaker. But if we can get them into those later rounds by asking them questions, they lose their power. What'd you see, coach? No, I thought we got hit. I thought we got hit. Yeah, coach, I had the defender in a legal guarding position, and he jumped straight up, giving him great verticality. So that was good defense, in my opinion. And then that's it. Coach, the defender maintained their legal guarding position. So that's why we did not have a foul in that play. 
Did you see something different? Rule-based explanation, legal guarding position, maintained legal guarding position, right? Did you see something different? So it's a combination of the rule-based explanation and then reapplying the pressure of the question that makes that response powerful. Similar question, but I wanted to give you the opposite end of it. Ref, how is that a foul? Coach, the defender never established legal guarding position on the play. So when the crash happened, the defender was not legal. So for those reasons, I had a foul. Did you see something different? What did you see? Tell me exactly what you saw. These are, these are not three questions I would say one after the other. These are just three examples of what you could say as a question. The, de the defender lost their verticality by moving forward. Did you see something different? Anybody have any other um, responses that would be effective when a coach says, how is that a foul? Anybody want to throw it to the chat? We can all learn from you. If you feel inspired, put something through and Brian will uh, ping, ping me. Here's one. Most officials are unaware that this is an unsportsmanlike thing to say. Most officials do not address this. They just answer whatever the question is and, and try to answer the, why the foul count is lopsided. You can't answer that question. That's, that's too generic of a topic. We're not going to explain all nine fouls right now. We're not going to explain the defense that you're running. No. So when a coach says, Paul, the foul count is 7-2. Coach, I'm very aware of the foul count, the time, and the score, but that's the last time we're going to talk about the scoreboard. Do you have a specific question about the play? I, oh, I'm always hitting on that point. You got to let them know that it's not sportsmanlike, whether you do it in a really nice way or a firm way, and I've done all, all of them. Paul, Paul, the, Paul, the foul count seven two. Like if he comes at me in a soft tone like that, coach, I'm aware the foul count is seven two, but I also want to make you aware it's not sportsmanlike to talk about the foul count. We can't talk about it anymore. See how I got real kind with him there? But that's I'm going to contextualize my response based on how he's coming at me. And that's the key with communication. It's making it contextual. These are these are general approaches that we have with these bullets, but you have to specif specify it and contextualize it in your game with your coach based on your history in that game. Yes, we're aware. I wanted to make you aware that it's unsporting to talk about the foul count. I would never question in your integrity. Do you have a specific question? I just want to also just provide clarity of what a not of what not an effective response is, and I've been guilty of this. When the coach questions your foul count, they're basically questioning our fairness. They're basically questioning our integrity. But what I've learned is they don't realize they're doing that. They have no clue. So to, to go the route of you're questioning my integrity, or are you questioning my fairness? It never works out well. The coach is always going to respond defensively. They're going to be shocked that you even said that. So I would say, don't go that route. You can incorporate it into your response. See the way I did, I would never question your integrity. Did you have a specific question? <clears throat> you can incorporate it, but don't make it your main, your main response there. Because basically every time I've done it, it has not gone well. Because they don't know that they're questioning our integrity, but they are. My guy got hit. Paul, my guy got hit. Coach, I had a good look at that play, and although there was some incidental contact, I didn't think there was a legal contact. I speak to a lot of my mentees, and I always cut them off when they say, and they're describing a play, and they say, yeah, there was contact. There was contact. I say, get specific. Was there incidental or illegal contact? Don't just say contact. Contact doesn't mean anything. It's generic, and it needs to be specified. So either when you're saying contact, it should have an illegal in front of it or an incidental in front of it. And those are good responses to use. These are good phrases to use with the coach, incidental, legal contact. Coach, you might be right, but I wasn't 100%, so I left it alone because I didn't want to guess. That goes over very well. Coaches respect the fact that you're being open and honest, that you're not guessing. They don't want guessers. And I encourage everybody on the call not to be a guesser when you're play calling. Just to get on the play calling tip, if you're not 100%, don't blow the whistle. If you're 99%, don't blow the whistle.
If you're 99%, you're closer to zero than you are to 100. Just be 100. Be 100, trust your partners. The defender is still moving. I'm sure you guys love hearing this on TV. I'm sure when Jay Billis or any of your favorite commentators say, oh, the defender is still moving, it's got to be a block, you guys go nuts. But I don't want you to go nuts. I want you to maintain your composure and not let anybody get you frustrated. This is part of the emotional thick skin. I'm, I don't go nuts anymore when I hear that on the TV or wherever. I just respond effectively and I move on. Um, coach, the def uh, defender is still moving. Coach, the defender can legally slot the defender can legally slide laterally, obliquely, and backwards and still take a charge. Did you have him moving forward? All right, so I showed him the three legal ways that they can move, and then I showed them the illegal, asked him the illegal way if they move forward. No, he didn't move forward. No, he, he didn't move forward. He's moving back. Okay, so so it's legal. He can he can legally, you know, slide to the right to maintain. Coach, unless you had the defender moving forward, then the defender can legally move to maintain their legal guarding position. Did you see something? Is that what you saw? Tell me what you saw. If you hear the defender is still moving, we have to educate them. That's our opportunity to be the expert. And I hear refs still say that too. That's not referee talk. That's fan talk. That's coach talk. That's player talk. It's not rule-based conversations or language. Here's a good one. Here's a really good topic right here. My guys are getting crushed, destroyed, killed, pummeled, mugged. How many times do we hear coaches use that language in a conversation? The minute you hear it, address that. Don't address the play. We cannot have a conversation under the framework of someone was destroyed or someone was pummeled. What are we talking about? We're not, talk we're not, we're not talking basketball right now killed god forbid like really so you got to check them on this i had a coach the other night i called a foul for his team come on come on he's getting mugged i said coach we just called a foul for your team and please don't use that unrealistic language when you're asking me a question or describing a play not another word from him all night i attack i attack you know you 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 got to know what to address and immediately when i hear mugged like my eyes light up because I know that's easy. That's easy. That's an easy response. I'm going to win this one, you know, because it's just unprofessional. It's unrealistic. So, coach, if we're going to have an effective dialogue, we need to use realistic terms. Saying your players are getting killed is not a fair way to communicate. Coach, we can discuss plays, but only if you're going to be respectful and reasonable. You're not using reasonable terms, making it impossible to have a conversation. Offense, firmness, like crush that response. I know I'm, I used crushed and uh, to their crush, but like for me, this was an easy one. How does your partner not see that? You know, this, is, this made me think of, uh, I saw something on Facebook the other day of somebody basically asked a question, how do we respond when a coach questions your partner? And I was just looking at a lot of the comments and it just further proved to me that we're undereducated on, on how to respond to the coach. And that's why this system of rapid responses is so important because we have a system of how to respond when a coach questions your partner. There's a couple different things they'll say about our partners and I'll give you a couple options based on how they play it. How does your partner not see that? This is one. This works all the time. Coach, I don't want my partner explaining my call, so I'm not going to try to explain his. They respect that. That's basically working at a 99% clip. So take that one. Coach, I had the exact same thing, and I trust my teammate. So if, you, if your partner calls a foul and you had good knowledge about it, agree with them. I, coach, I had the same exact thing, and I trust my teammate. You know, especially when they're, like, skeptical of it, and then they look at you like, Paul, did you have the same thing? Coach, I had the exact same thing. Like, not the same thing, the exact same thing. These are, the two, these are two of the easier ones. Now we'll get into when they're giving more of an unsporting uh, exchange about our partners. Paul, you got to help him out. He's struggling. Coach, with all due respect, 
I would never speak negatively about one of your assistants. So let me just backtrack. When they speak about our partners, we have to leverage their assistant coaches. You're speaking negatively about our partners. I'm going to show you I would never do that to your assistant coaches. Two-way respect. That should make it very clear in that moment that that's wrong by them. So, coach, with all due respect, I would never speak negatively about your assistants. And I even point to the assistants as I'm speaking to the coach. And that's probably one second when I will look away to the assistant coaches. With all due respect, I would never speak negatively about one of your assistants. Please have the same respect for our crew. Is that fair? And I finish it with, is that fair? And that's a home run, 100% knockout response. It's never not worked, except one time this year. But guess what? The coach didn't come back at me one time the rest of the game. I'll just, I'll share that experience with you. So my partner's getting ready to inbound. He just called a charge, obvious charge call. I'm right in front of the coach. He says, that was terrible. It was terrible. And I'm, I've, you probably heard me speak how I think that's usually a technical foul when they say terrible. He said it in a low tone. So that's terrible. That's terrible. I said, whoa, 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 coach, coach. I would never speak negatively like that about one of your partners. He goes, that was terrible. <laughs> he, he raised the ante. He doubled down. It should have been a technical foul. Yes, you're right, Clark. It should have been, I think. Um, but I decided to use my words there, and I doubled down and went even more firm. When he said that's terrible, again, whoa, whoa, coach, 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 coach. And I said coach about five times, looking him in the face. I would never speak negatively about your partners have the same respect or your coaches have the same respect for our crew. Is that understandable? Is that fair? And I just remember, you know, we kind of went back and forth at it a little bit, but I was proud because like, that's the firmness that I'm talking about this year. We got to have that firmness. I know a year's past, I would have said that opening line. He would have barked back at me and I would have been out. Now it's like, no, no, no partner don't don't put the ball back in my partner was looking at me the whole time holding it up kind of just waiting for me and i just think we need that consistent firmness don't let up it's got to be relentless they'll get it it sometimes it takes them more than one time just because you mentioned sportsmanship doesn't mean they're fixed you got to just continue to reinforce so that's one thing i've observed about my res responses and my interactions this year is I'm just relentless. I'm a broken record of sportsmanship. And they'll get it. They'll get it if you just keep keep at it. Most of them will. Um, back to, you got to help them out. He's struggling. Coach, it would be a great, and this is another thing I started doing this year, is giving the coaches tips and actually coaching the coaches because they need it. Now, a lot of people on this call might not have the courage for that, but hopefully we get you to the point. It's not that serious. and in, and at the end of the day, everything I'm saying about these responses, I'm sharing truth. Point, point to one of these responses and, and show me where it's lies. Coach, it would be a great idea to stop thinking about the officiating and getting back and get back to your role leading your players. How can we how can we refocus you on that? How can we get you to refocus on that? So coaching the coaches sometimes in that moment to get them back into their role because they forget their role. And remember, there's four roles in the game. There's a player. Their job is to work hard, hustle through the ups and downs of the game, play the game. There's the coaches. Their, their job is to be a positive leader for their players and coach their team. There's the spectators. Their job is to be cheer for their team. It has nothing to do with you know, being disrespectful to the opponents, cheering and uplifting and supporting your team. And then there's the referees maintaining safety, fairness, doing their best to get the plays right. So coaches have clearly forgotten their role because they're refereeing. So I think it's more, we have more than enough leverage to let them know what their role is. Sometimes we've got to give them a little nudge. Coach, coach, you got to focus on your players. Coach, coach, you're coaching the officials and the players. You're making your job even harder. Just focus on your players. What do you think, Brian? Would you use that? Yes, absolutely, I would. It's a good line to pull out. Yeah, they, they need that help sometimes in the moment because they're so emotionally wrapped up in the game. 
So coach begins to criticize the calls. So everything we spoke about so far has been pretty light. You know, um, now it's going to start to get a little bit more on sporting. Um, so coach, did I skip them? You got to help him out. Hey, ref, the same play happened and you called the foul. Hey, Ray ref, the same play happened and you called the foul. Coach, plays can be similar, but they're never, they're very rarely the same. It's a different play. Don't let the coaches weaponize that against you by saying it's the same exact play. Don't have a conversation under that framework that it's two exact plays. Separate that and say, coach, I understand there's some similarities there, but no plays are the same. There's never been the same play to happen twice. Just think about all the factors you need. You need the same players, same positioning, same contact. You know, like it's going to be different anyways. So don't let that stick. Coach, if the ex and then you could say this. Coach, if the exact same play happens, we're going to have the exact same result. But in my opinion, we're discussing two different plays. What did you say? And you could finish it with a question there. Coach begins to criticize the calls. Coach, I'm very approachable if you have a question. Everybody in my mentor group knows this is my go-to line, and I would adapt it for you guys. It's a great entryway into the conversation. Coach, I'm very approachable. You're letting them know I'm, I'm nice, and I listen. Very approachable if you have a question. But if you can't communicate in a sportsmanlike manner, then we're not going to be able to have a conversation. So by entering the conversation in a kind way, and letting them know I'm here for you if you have a legit question, then we can open up the doors to play offense. If I came in just playing offense, it might not be as effective. So I would go that route. I'm very approachable if you have a question, but if you can't communicate in a sportsmanlike manner, then we're not going to be able to have a conversation. We can't have a conversation if you're yelling. Coach, I'm not going to speak to you if you keep yelling. We can't. I can hear you. You're right here. Use your, use your indoor voice. Coach, with all due respect, I would never tell you which plays to run. Please don't tell me which fouls to call. Paul, you got to call that. Paul, you got to call that foul. Coach, with all due respect, I would never tell you which plays to run. Please don't tell me which fouls to call. Let's just focus on our roles in the game. Is that fair? What are they going to say to that? If, whatever they do say, I'll be ready to respond. Because now we've established that framework within – that conversation and you'll be you'll be even better in round two and they'll be even weaker in round two and we don't want to go multiple rounds it's not i'm not telling you guys to go eight rounds it's not like boxing but there's definitely an element to the to the verbal to the verbal judo and the back and forth and i i like it i find it competitive like i want to i want to win every conversation with the coaches to be honest with you um what else we got? So coach shouts his opinions onto the court. That's a foul. That's a travel. Again, notice the trend. Notice the pattern. Be aware of it. If he did it once, that's once. If he does it three times, we have to address it. You got to address it. Stop avoiding it. Stop fearing it. Get in there. Get your hands dirty. Most officials don't want to do it because of fear, because of the friction. Oh, the game's going so smoothly. I don't want to go up to him and talk to him right now. I just let him have it. There's four minutes left. We'll be in the locker room. We'll be out. Get your hands dirty. Get in there. Run the game. Coach, we're very approachable if you have a question, but we're not going to tolerate you shouting negative comments onto the court. I love that. I love saying, please stop shouting negative comments because it makes them feel bad. It makes them feel bad in a way not that they're going to be depressed. Makes them feel bad, like, oh, oh, shit, he's right. I want them to say in their mind, oh, shit, he's right. So the negative comments has had a, has been a very high success rate for me. Um, coach, we've already spoke about respectful communication in the pregame, and shouting onto the court is not a professional way to conduct yourself. So during the pregame for high school, and I know every state is different, but when I meet with the captains and I meet with the coaches, I'll give you my entire spiel. And it's, uh, it's really important for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're establishing the, the respectful guidelines of communication. But then number two, you can then rehash the pregame conversation in a future conversation. So we get the captains together. Guys, we'll keep this short and sweet, okay? Sportsmanship is the number one point of emphasis this year. There's no trash talking, taunting, or baiting. White talks to white, blue talks to blue. If we talk to you, we're trying to help you. Besides that, respect each other, respect us, respect the game. Coaches, 
eye contact, both coaches back and forth. Coaches, we're very approachable if you have a question at the right time, but we expect respectful and professional communication. Are we good? Right? So we've established it there. Now, four minutes into the game, we notice a pattern developing. Coaches shouted three times onto the court. I'm getting to the coach at the timeout. I'm letting him coach his team during the timeout. Once the timeout is done, I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to say, Coach, we're very approachable if you have a question, but I think in the pregame we spoke about respectful and professional communication and shouting across the court is not professional. I'm going to need you to do better than that. I'm going to need you to be more professional than that. Can you work with me here? So that's why I think establishing that language in the pregame is very effective because you can pull from it and insert it into your game. Hey, hey, bro. Hey, coach. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bro, but it's like I was just trying to like speak off the court. Like, hey, we already spoke about this. Like, what do you mean you don't understand? We've already established this. So it's been working out for me. And I, I gave you an example earlier when I gave the coach a warning and I talked, hey, coach, we spoke about respectful communication, but I respect you. Okay, well, maybe you need to be more aware about how you're communicating. That was a dagger. Gesturing with the hands. Um, so, you know, he's just throwing his arms up, throwing his arms up. Coach, there's no need to demonstrate with your hands. Please use your words. Coach, you can talk to me. Use your words. The hands look really bad. Hands look bad. No need to be demonstrative. I've had coaches that try to demonstrate the foul on me, and they'll give me like a little little arm bar. I'm like, Coach, no need to make contact with me. That's not a good way of explaining it. You can use your words. Don't let them foul you. Now, you don't have to, re to react like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But let them know that's not cool. Let them know to keep their distance, step away from that. You know, I had a, I had a coach do that earlier, and, and, and the new conversation was not about the play. It shifted to please don't touch me when you're explaining the call. Um, coach, throwing your arms up when you disagree with the call does not show good sportsmanship. Do you see the respectful way I'm talking to you? We need that two-way respect. Can you work with me? Question at the end, reapplying the pressure. And when you add that question at the end, you're layering your response. You're coming in with a great intro. I'm very approachable. I would never. You're giving them the rule-based explanation or you're playing offense and dictating the terms of the dialogue. Then you're finishing it with a question. It's just bam, bam, bam. So that's going to add more impact and more, uh, more punch to your response. Um, I have a couple other items, or I have a couple other items uh, to go over. But Brian, do you think we should get into Q and A now and and go uh, go deep with with everybody? I would love to answer some some of your questions if you have. I know we've established a lot tonight. We've uh, you know given you a lot of a lot of content. So I would love to hear some of your thoughts and just kind of how your games are going or any questions that you might have, how to apply this. So, yeah, I think that's a great idea, Paul. Maybe if people want to, you know, come off mute and just ask questions uh, for Paul, I know the CWA um, guys and gals are all together. So if somebody wants to be the spokesperson for that group um, and get close to the microphone, you know, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions. I mean, we got Paul for 15 more minutes, so it's, it's now, or ne it's now or never. Eight. Yeah, thanks, Paul, for <laughs> the count. Paul, can you please stop with telling us how much time is left? Please don't do that with the scoreboard. Thank you. <laughs> it's the last time we're going to talk about how much time is remaining. A uh, couple, couple questions I see in the chat. Yeah, this is going to be on the podcast. Once I edit all other 12 ep episodes that are sitting on my dashboard first, but uh, yeah, we'll, get to, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, yeah, and in the email that we send out, you guys will get a copy of this PDF for sure. Uh, yeah, but I'll make sure that gets disseminated out. Because mm -hmm. I'm recording this so I can I can keep the chat in uh, in an archive. So I'll be able to pull everyone's email addresses. Ben, uh, we got Guy raised his hand. Guy, why don't you unmute? Take it away, brother. Or are you trying to give me a high five? Ben, go ahead. There we go. There we go. Now we got it. Hear me now? Yes. So one of the things that um, 
I just wanted to kind of ask your your opinion on this. Um, I've I've heard it taught different ways on free throws. Typically, what I've been taught and what I practice is when I'm trail on a free throw, um, I will go report the free throw, go to the 28 foot line next to the bench for the first free throw, um, not next to it, but close enough. If the coach has a question, um, a legitimate question, then I can answer it. And then usually I try to answer that question on that first free throw. And then if I, I will typically take a step or two away and however many steps I take away depends on the quality of our communication, but I usually will take two, three steps away just to indicate to the coach I've answered your question. Now we're done. We're not going to communicate about the same thing for two free throws. And secondly, if he decides at that point, they didn't like what I had to say and wants a technical foul, he's got to sort of yell at me to where other people can hear it. I don't want him right in my ear telling me that I'm, you know, a piece of garbage. You know what I mean? That sort of thing. I've had other guys that tell me that they go stand away from the coach on the first free throw and then next to the coach on the second. So I just wanted to know what your thoughts on, are on that. Well, what does the mechanics manual say? That's a great question. I should know that. So I know every state is different, but in a three-person game, this is this a three-person game? Yes. Okay. Yeah, two-person game, we stand more towards the semicircle at half court at the division line. So that's where I tend to stand on the first shot, and then I'll rotate over to the 28-foot mark. So I would, I, and and I believe that that um, rule or mechanic was put in place to avoid that interaction. Got it. Okay. Yep. And again, don't don't go looking for conversations. Shouldn't shouldn't even be entering in your head like, oh, I'm gonna answer his question. You know, like you're roughing the game. If they pop up on your radar, then you gotta determine is this something I need to address. If not, we're gonna just keep it moving. I hope that that helps. I know uh, it's more of a mechanics question. Is there anything else I can answer for you, Guy? No, that was great. Thank you. Sure. Dion, what's up, man? Good to see you. I hope you're well. Why don't you unmute? Hey, Paul, how you doing? Thanks for this again. Yes, sir. Hey, I kind of got uh, a two-part question. Um, First off, I, I love the responses that you gave through the presentation. Um, but how do you, one, um, give your responses in a, a professional way, like you're using your tone or like you were saying, your demeanor without being, without coming off maybe like snobbish or just like straight asshole or whatever? Um, so that, that's my first question. I'm never an asshole, so I don't worry about that. And I don't think about, I don't care how the coach perceives me. This is part of the fear factor we have to eliminate. We have to stop caring what the coach is going to think of how you perform. I'm not worried about being a jerk. I'm not a jerk. Don't don't um, confuse me being firm and trying to uphold the respect and sportsmanship that's built into the rule book as me being a jerk. So I'm not worried about that. And and this comes down to my intent. I'm self-aware. I know I know who I am. You hear me talk a lot about being kind to everybody all the time. Right. So I know in, in this environment, I'm I'm not I'm not leading with kindness all the time. I'm not gonna say that because it's not really applicable, right? If like if, if there's a car coming on the street and you have to communicate with somebody to get out of the way, you're not gonna be kind to them. Right? You gotta step up, use your authority voice. But no, I'm not. I'm not worried about what they think. I know. I know this is correct. I know this is. We need more force. We need more. A little bit more tools. We've not been given the proper tools historically on how to do this and how to really run the game on how to kind of. I don't want to say fight back because that's not what we're going for. But you guys know what I'm getting at here. They they are the ones just throwing the punches all the time. We have to step up our level of strength. And if, and if, like, I had coaches the other day. <laughs> the coach, we got observed, right? And uh, my, my observer texted me after the game. He's like, the coaches came up to me. They're like, what's up with that guy? They're like, what's up with Paul? Now, that's not even a conversation that I feel like the observer should have had. He, but I guess, you know, people are, they keep it per personal and not professional. 
But I, that didn't even pop up on my radar because these these coaches are used to doing whatever they want to a rep. So when another ref steps up and shows firmness, they want to go tell and say, what's wrong? This guy's crazy. I'm okay with that. They, they're not my boss. So right. why I'm going to put it back to you. Why do you care how they perceive you? They're not your boss. Well, my question wasn't more so because I don't I don't really care how anyone perceives me. But like you were saying in, earlier in the presentation that, you know, basically your demeanor and being professional and respectful and serving the game, you know, that that's usually before you even step on the court. So um, how do you maintain that? And that question was actually leading into the second part, which is when you have those situations in the game where maybe a coach is, you know, loud or shouting across the court. Um, have you found yourself addressing that with the same tone? Like, are you matching tones or, or, cause I, I've heard this, um, what's, what's done um, demonstratively and loud should be matched. Like if the, if the crowd hears the coach, you know, coming at the ref, then the ref should also be just as loud and letting the, you know, spectators know you know what's going on in the game or what's not tolerated you know what we permit what we promote so how are you addressing those situations are you you know not in a you know trying to show up the coach but are you also matching the tone or being um just as demonstrative but respectful in that same instance i'm never mapping my decisions based on how the the, the crowd is perceiving the interaction with the coach so i don't want you to think about right. the fans the fans are irrelevant um well, I'm not, I'm not going to match the coach's volume or level of demonstrativeness or level of negativity. So that's not something we're going to match. But you got to kind of almost um, be the good version of that. So, you know, if a coach is loud and, and, and demonstrative, my 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 level of response is going to be that. You know, it's just going to it's going to hit. It's going to hit a little bit harder, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm throwing my arms up and I'm shouting at him. I've never I've never had a shout at a coach. I may raise my voice. I might project a little bit more. I may show a little bit more firmness. Like last night, the coach was, um, you know, complaining, complaining. And I was just like, um, coach, you have to focus. Coach, coach, you have to focus on coaching your players. Stop coaching the coach. Coach, stop coaching the officials and focus on your players. There's no reason for us to be having a conversation right now. You just spoke to my partner at the timeout. So it's not like, um, you know, I'm, I'm yelling at them, but uh, you just got to step up your level of firmness and it's got nothing to do with the fans. Hope that helped. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate your answers. Um, yes, sir. I thank, thank you again. I hope to see you this summer in Atlanta. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Good questions. Uh, we got Josh. Josh's phone. <clears throat> hey, thanks, Paul. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Crystal. Uh, yeah. All right, great. I'm I'm Josh. I'm I'm over in New York. Um, Where at? And I love the content. Uh, Long Island, Suffolk County. Okay. Um, yeah, I love the content you're putting Thank out. You. So earlier you had meant, yeah, earlier you had mentioned that you know if there's a a conversation that you're having with the coach, especially if it, if it's getting a little more heated than it should, that you're and you have the ball, you're not going to put the ball in play. Or if your partner has the ball, he's not going to put the ball in play until you're done. But on these regular conversations that you're having, how do you continue to have these while not having the game be choppy, where there's still a game flow? Because um, some of these aren't quick snippets back and forth. Some of these, especially if you're ending with a question, and then they do give you a response, you know, how are you keeping and maintaining game flow um, during all this? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the examples I gave to or dead ball conversations, not necessarily when we're running up and down the court. We don't have that kind of time. Um, I would recommend, you know, I'd like to say you shouldn't be speaking to a coach on a live ball, but it just doesn't always play out like that. I mean, I do it. I do it a lot, to be honest with you, because I'm not just going to sit there and not say anything sometimes. Sometimes we need to address them during a live ball, whether it's, coach, let me focus, I'll get to you at a timeout, or not right now, or, you know, like you. So there are some conversations, but any of the in-depth back and forth that we spoke about tonight, these are ideally going to happen during a timeout or during a dead ball. Oh, yeah. And I don't even mean live ball situations at all. Like, is there is there a situation where you would say, um, like, hey, I, I hear you on this one. Let, let's get to me at the next timeout, and I got you then. You know, just to kind of get the ball back in place so you're not allowing them to kind of dictate the pace of play where every 
single time there's a whistle, a dead ball situation, you know, they're kind of in your ear. Yeah, I mean, well, that's something to address in itself. Every time there's a stoppage of play, we shouldn't have to be having a conversation with the coach. Once a pattern develops, meaning he did it two or three times, then we need to address that. Coach, I'm very approachable if you have a question, but this is like your fourth question in the first quarter, and you're starting to become a distraction in the game. That's just one one way I might take it. Um, the coach communication is never going to impact the flow of the game. Even though you may hear me, I, I held the game up. That's rare that that's going to happen. It's a possibility. We have that opportunity to hold on for five seconds if you can just be patient and not be in a rush to get this coach out of the way so we can get back to the, the line of the game because that's what we want to get back to the line. When we were speaking, the coaches were getting offline. So anything we can do to put them back in line. But, yeah, I mean, we should not be – address the patterns that happen. So if you see them becoming a distraction, that becomes the topic. Sportsmanship over explanation is something I think I didn't mention tonight, but it's going to help you guys. As far as, like, the topics of our conversations with the coaches, sportsmanship is more important than giving an explanation about a play. So if you feel that sportsmanship is in question, meaning you don't like the way he's speaking to you and he's asking you for an explanation about the play, you could give a quick explanation, but sportsmanship is the topic now. So make sure we address sportsmanship over explanation. You could do both, but don't just do one. Coach is shouting at you, how was that not a foul? Well, coach, I had him in a legal guarding position. What did you see? I'm not giving that response there. I have to address the shout. I don't even care about the play. I'm going to give you guys a tip. I, I talk about sportsmanship way more than I talk about the play calling component. I change the subject. Again, something I didn't mention tonight. Change the subject matter. You want to talk about the play? Cool. I'll mention the play for three seconds. Now we're going to talk about you shouting across the court. I get to determine the next topic. Leverage. I got you. Much appreciated. Thank you, Paul. Anytime. Chad, Chad's iPhone. Yeah, this is a question for both um, you and Brian Kenny um, regarding mechanics and your use of uh, unapproved NFHS mechanics in the videos. I mean, I like them. Brian, what are your thoughts about using some of these in the state of Wisconsin? Um, like So like the hit to the head signal? I, I always tell officials to use the hit signal first, the one that we have approved by the Federation, and then, you know, go, you know, go to the head to clarify, because that's, if we were to use the hit to the, the hit to the head signal without an approved mechanic, we have observers in our state and others that probably wouldn't be very happy with that. So right. we, we have to teach guys to use and gals to use the approved signal you know with the hit or you know hit and then the head so that way you know coaches and the players know you know hey this is a safety fall i had a player get hit in the head so got it i hope that answers that one and the hardest yeah. one i think the hardest one is to go to not to not just go and give the punch signal um we need to go behind the head um, just like they do in men's college. That's been really hard for officials to, you know, get used to that one. But when in doubt, go with the approved mechanic. And then if you need to deviate with a further clarifying signal, do it. But don't use that as your primary signal. I know, Paul, I'm sure you probably might have other guidance I can tell by your, by your Paul, I know you pretty well. You've heard, you've heard me speak about this topic before. I, I have. It's. To me, it's a, it's irrelevant. A lot a lot of this signal mechanics. So again, this is my opinion. But you mentioned, oh, the observer is not going to be happy. I don't factor that in at all. I don't think about that stuff at all. I'm not looking to make the observer happy because I'm not out here refing to get the playoff game or the high rating. I'm out here trying to run the game, trying to do my best to get the plays right and do what's best for the game. And I put that ahead of everybody. I put that ahead of coaches. I put that ahead of observers, clinicians, all of that. And I've watched this specific play. 
and it's much more effective by using the unapproved hit to the head signal and letting everybody know. It's, it's also a ma- it's also a game management built in because when you let them know that you hit they got hit in the head, they're not going to question you. If you show a hit, now you might have to go give an explanation. It's like, why are we even going to do that? Just to be book right? We all don't do 100% of the things in the book. And I don't think everybody really understands that, the hip- hypocrisy in some of this. Like, we all don't do exactly what's in the book. Sometimes we have to deviate. But those are two different answers. you got to pick which one you're going to use. It's up to you. Paul, I agree. Thank you. Oh, I agree with you. <laughs> just just so you know that, I agree with you. I agree, too. Yeah, I, I got observed the other day, and uh, the first thing in the uh, locker room, uh, this is a high school game, and I was like, Paul, you're not counting the 10-second backcourt count. I'm like, yeah, I use the shot clock. I'm like, um, robots are better at counting than humans. I'm going to just use the shot clock. I'm, I'm, you, can't, you can't convince me that my hand count is – more effective than just looking at the shot clock. And eventually I think once we all get a shot clock, this rule is going to be changed, but I don't, I don't know. I can't control that, but. Um, oh, Paul, we don't have a shot clock in Wisconsin. <laughs> so then you have to, you have to count. Not yet. No. Yet. Yet. Not, yes. not yet. Not yet. The game clock isn't going to work for that. Um, let's get to Chan. Chan Wang. How you doing? Thanks for joining us. Hey Paul. Thank you. Uh, great stuff, guys. Okay, mm-hmm. my question is, uh, this is Chen Wang from um, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, preventive officiating, like uh, hand checking, keeping your, ha- your hands off or moving screens. And you, would you tell the coach that, hey, hey, coach, watch your, your players are hand checking or you see nope. they're moving a little bit? No, Not really. Not really. And then, no, okay. Not really? Yeah, because no. I, I, I find that I find that really good and lower levels but the higher levels the coach would dismiss you or or you know just wave your oh yeah here we go again you know How well, do what's, you he gonna, this stuff? What's, what's he gonna do he's gonna take your information and then go tell his player and it's gonna prevent it i don't, I don't know if it's the case if, if it's a foul a foul i understand what you're trying to do and i think there are some times where you might go give the coach a heads up i think this applies most most notably when um like a player is starting to act on sporting this is a great example of, yes, go up to the coach. Hey, coach, I just want to come over as a courtesy. Number seven, I've had to speak to two times. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to manage him if you could help us out. So that's a great example of when to do that. But as far as like fouls, like, coach, you got to watch your illegal screens. Your feet are be- your player's feet are being set too wide. Now, now I'm going and giving you a rules clinic in the middle of the game and almost coaching you how to set a proper screen that's the coach's job to know how to set a proper screen so i I would say yeah i would say use it when it's um you know sportsmanship issue or when their players are starting to act on sporting that would be a good application of it but i wouldn't recommend doing it for other fouls okay yeah it was just like the hand checking it was right there um out the push and then the push it came became almost pretty well close uh, to intentional foul because the player went up and got shelved, and I didn't have the audacity or the conviction to upgrade it. That's why I'm asking. Mm. Yeah, we, we're very hesitant to call flagrant or intentional fouls. We want to stay calm, and it's, it's part of. I think it's another example of the fear. I've been guilty of it too a lot of times. Our natural, I think, state is to just stay calm and. At, if we can keep it common as much as possible and not upgrade when it's just another call in the game. Um, just one thing on the hand checks, I'm always using my voice on hand checks. Uh, hands off, hands off, no hands, no hands. And, you know, no one hears me do that. And I'm not worried if they do hear me do that because I'm allowed to speak to the players however I'd like. So don't worry about a coach saying, hey, you can't tell them. No, 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 coach, coach. I'm not telling you how to coach your players. Please don't tell me how to manage the game. Don't let them weaponize that against you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Michael W. What's up, Mike? Great questions, guys. Keep going. Hey, sir. Uh, great I'm call. I'm here for you. Question to Thank you. you. Um, 
sometimes you find yourself either mentoring or being mentored. Um, what is the best time, you know, based on your experience to be able to share and how discreetly, you know, what are some of your best practices in terms of being discreet as to not show up that younger official, you know, for, for example, like pointing and, and doing things like that. That's to me, it's, it's kind of letting everybody in the gym know that this person is, is green. So just wanted to get your thoughts. On um, that. Like you're saying in-game mentoring? Yeah, in-game mentoring. Okay. Um, it depends on the level. If we're working a youth game, I'm going to put on a full clinic and point and put them in a position and like walk through because it's just a, a rec game, I feel. So if it's like a lower level game, I won't even be conscious of that. Um, if it's a high school game, I try not to give a lot of tips at, um, during timeouts. That's for like halftime. Um, I'm not going to come out and mentor anybody in the middle of the game. I don't even really talk about past plays. This is something I would recommend for you guys when you're getting together at your timeouts. Stop talking about what happened in the past. Don't talk about previous plays. There's some times you're going to rehash previous plays, but you just want to be a forward thinker. You want to have that next play mentality. And when we start to backtrack and dwell, and how many times do we like talk about a call maybe we don't like? Your partner had a, you know, called a block instead of a charge. Hey, why'd you have a block there? What did the defender do wrong? And we're having this in-game conversation during the middle of our timeout, and it's going to lead to self-doubt. It's going to lead to the, my partner leading the conversation now questioning himself. We can talk about that at halftime. We can talk about the game. I don't care what you just called. I care about your next play. I care about getting you focused to the next play. That doesn't mean you can't share your wisdom and, and help people out, um, but I wouldn't be concerned about what other people are going to think. What, what are you doing? You're helping. What do we have to be worried about? So let me ask you, what is, what? not to say you're worried, but what is your reservation about I just about feel that? like, say, if a coach says something to you about a, a call that your partner missed and you, you show the vote of confidence to say, you know, my, my partner's right on top of the call. Coach, I, I, I trust his judgment, that type of thing. And, you, you know, you completely were just covering uh, for your partner, you know, because you got a glimpse of it or whatever. I just don't believe that, it, to your point, there's ever a good time to share that information until, like, you know, halftime, you know, um, because it just makes everyone in the gym know that this is the, you know, the green or the rookie person on the crew, and we're going to come at him or question him or talk about his calls or whatever. And it just puts everyone in a bad light. I hear that. I also want to eliminate the oh what what is the coach going to say if i do this um thought from your minds because i know a lot of we base a lot of our decisions on maybe not a lot but we base some of our decisions on what is the coach going to say make sure you you call a foul that you can explain to the coach what are we scared of right you know like we got to eliminate this fear factor of what the coach is going to call you over for i'm ready to explain everything you know if i'm working with a partner who isn't that experience and is missing things out there. I'm going to defend him and I'm going to make sure the coach is not showing him up. And, you know, it's the same, same approach. And do you help your partner also when those conversations kind of go get away from him where he doesn't have the quick response um, experience? Well, well, how could I, how could I help them if he's talking to the coach? I'm just asking, like, what, what do you mean exactly? I don't know, maybe a gesture partner, let's go or something like that just to get the game going. You know, he's over there too long. He's kind of having a con uh, getting away from him. conversations, getting away from him. You can kind of hear it where the coach is kind of leading or dominating the conversation. Sure. So if I if I have a sample size that, you know, the, my partner has been maybe unsuccessful with his interactions with the coach and I see the coach is kind of taking advantage of it, you may have to step up there for your partner and be a great partner and not worry, you know, that you know, the coach is going to be like, I'm not even talking to you. I love to say, okay, coach, but I'm speaking directly to you. I'm glad you're not talking to me. That's awesome. But I'm talking to you. Yeah. But a good question. Uh, we got Steve Hansen. What's up, Steve? Crown Rush mentor. Hey, how's it going, Paul? Um, yeah. Hey, I had a game the other day, um, and I wasn't quite sure how to respond to it. Um, players were kind of getting their hands on a little bit. I was talking about getting their hands off, like you've talked about. Um, but I had the coach right behind me saying, look, he's pushing him, he's pushing him. And, and I wasn't sure how to respond. Um, I guess a good way to respond and get the coach to stop talking to me because I've had him two or three times this year. And it just is kind of the thing that they like to do. 
Coach, you're breathing in my ear right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I will. <laughs> but if a, like you're speaking about a coach being right behind you and you're trying to concentrate on the play and he's talking in your ear, that's unacceptable. Correct. It's going to no happen. What it is, just as long as it's happening, it's gonna, I want to remove that. It's going to happen. However, once it becomes a pattern, back to the pattern, noticing the trends. Mm -hmm. Once it becomes a trend, got to play offense. So let's play this out. He talked to you three times. That's a foul. Steve, that's a foul. foul. That's a foul, Steve. Back down court on the other way. You guys got to call it. Steve, my guy's getting hit. My guy's getting hit. Does it again, third time, right? I may say something during the live ball, like, please stop being a distraction. Um, but let's say I did it. We're going to get to him at the timeout. Coach, coach, I'm very approachable if you have a question, but you're talking to me right in the middle of a live ball and you're becoming a distraction to the game. You got to let me focus. This game is hard enough. Paul, yeah, Paul. No, 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 no. Coach, coach, work with me here. Work with me here. I'm not coming up to you in your huddles and talking in your ear when you're talking to your players, right? No, you're not. All right, so just let me work. Like I said, if you have a question, ask me at the right time. It's not the right time when I'm refereeing a play out on the perimeter. It's not professional to be talking in my ear during the black ball. Offense, firmness, run the conversation. Like what you just said is leverage. Like as soon as you say that coach is literally in my ear, that's offense. That's an offensive opportunity. I would never go up to a coach and get that close to you and talk in his ear. You're not going to do it to me. You just got to have the courage to, to communicate that to them. Eye contact the whole time. They won't do it again or if they they might if they they do then you'll you know you, we have the rule book at our disposal how long so do you I, let that type of thing go on before you give them a bench warning for distracting you too much or do you do you approach that not you know again it's all going to depend on that game and that moment and the context of that you know you know the game and how they're communicating so it's tough to give you a blanket answer you know, if they're just if they're doing it the way I showed you, or it's just kind of talking in my ear, then I'm not going to warn them for that. I'm going to use my words. If they're shouting in my ear, that may be an immediate technical foul, maybe an immediate warning. Again, just got to have the awareness to know what to what tool to use in that point. Um, everything I'm giving you guys tonight is everything that falls under the threshold of a technical foul. A lot of there could be some of the, the the red lines that what the coaches were saying when I was doing the rapid responses. Paul, how is that not a foul? It could be a technical foul the way they say it. I'm just giving you the version that's not a technical foul. You have to determine what is. Does that work, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Yeah, just just remember the trend part. You know, if it happens multiple times, now you have the leverage to to go up to. If it happens once, okay, yeah, we may be a little that may be a little quick to address. Let it play out, and mm -hmm. now you build up a catalog, you build up history, and now you can recant what they're doing. That's why I say it's important to have this radar, to have this awareness of what we're doing, because then I'll reference that in the conversation, coach. You refereed four times, you called three travels and one foul, and you're shouting across the court to my partner in the second quarter too. So I'm, I'm rehashing this history. Jeffrey Smith, how are you, sir? Great, Paul, great. Thank you for, uh, love, love your podcast. Um, Thank you. The one of the genes territory should be in a time capsule. <laughs> a couple times, it's, it's outstanding. But uh, my question for you is, you know, we, uh, we start the girls' tournament season in Wisconsin next week. Emotions get a little bit higher. I, I love how you kind of break it apart. And you, the first thing before you even address a coach's question is getting the communication back where it needs to be. You, as, as emotions kind of escalate into the playoffs, do you have any other quick tips to try to, like, refocus Get that conversation back where it needs to be so it's professional. Um, what you just said, Coach. Coach, I understand. I understand this is an emotional setting. It's a playoff game. How do we get you to refocus back on your coaching your players? 
Can you give me a little bit more specifics about what they might say so I can give you a, a more contextual answer? It's more, yeah, like they, they're coming up here with the hands up, how, you know, how could you call it or something like that, where they just might be a little bit more demonstrative just because of the animation in the situation. You know, you maybe address the hands like, hey, we can we can have this conversation, but let's treat each other professionally. So, you know, yeah, but, this to me, this isn't a playoff regular season conversation. This is just the conversation right. between a coach and a ref. It's not it's irrelevant that, that it's uh, I understand emotions are higher. But I'm not going to mm-hmm. play it any different. I'm not going to respond any differently because it's a playoff game. Super, you know. So hopefully you were you were able to pick up some of the uh, bullets that are going to give you those you know ways to de-escalate or ways to establish those professional guidelines. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate your support. Those are some great questions. Anybody have anything else? Uh, I, I do enjoy Q and A, so I'll go a little bit longer. If you guys want to stick around, I'd be happy to uh, to jam with you. Ben, you got another question? Yeah, Paul. Hey, how you doing? How you um, doing? I want you to tell Mr. Pink I says hi. <laughs> that, All right, I that's will. a throwback from like way back when, <laughs> three, four years ago. Yeah, you're a day one guy. Day one, you betcha. Um, mm-hmm. I just wanted to ask you if you ever would you stop the game for a warning? I've been kind Absolutely. of told. Absolutely. Okay, because I've been yes. told both ways. Like, no, if you're going to stop the game, it's got to be an automatic technical foul. But if you want to address the behavior, I, my response is I want to address this behavior with this coach or this assistant coach or a player even. And, like, you know, this is not acceptable behavior. You know, you've been – or you've been warned. What, do you th- what are your thoughts on that? Uh, we want to address the behavior with either our words, with either a warning or with either a technical foul. So we have to, you know, determine what is the best tool in that moment. However – in the rule book in NFHS, the warning is an official, it's an official ruling, right? And I speak to officials all the time and they don't like the warning. They don't like the warning. And uh, I'm, I'm unemotional about rules. I don't care what they are. There's a warning rule in the book, so I'm gonna use it if I see it fits fit. A lot, of, a lot of refs are like, oh, it, it's no warning. It's either I'm gonna respond with my words or it's a technical foul. Well, I think there's a middle ground. The warning is very effective, especially in high school. So, yes, stop the game. What is your hesitancy with stopping the game for a warning? I don't is have it because, any. <laughs> is it because you've gotten mixed feedback yeah. from – Yeah, because referees are, are emotional about the rules and they get to – they pick and choose what they like. Oh, don't – like three seconds. Three seconds, you know, like don't call three seconds. Don't call – I'm going to call three seconds if they're in the lane more than three seconds. Now, I'm going to tell you to get out of the lane a couple times. But that's, you know, when I got into officiating, I think that was more applicable. Like, don't call the three seconds. Film has evolved greatly in this last decade. I don't want to miss calls. I want to get everything right. So if that means calling a three seconds, that's okay. So I thought about kind of what you've always said, what you permit, you promote. And the other uh, last night in the game, uh, we had an out-of-bounds call. Uh, the calling official wanted to go with the alternating possession arrow because he didn't have a good look at I was a lead official. Uh, me and the trail, I was center, the, me and the trail had a, a very strong opinion about who was out on because we had a better look at play. So we went over to him and, you know, we corrected it that we both had, you know, white from behind hitting it out-of-bounds. So it's blue ball. So I go, I'm in the center official, so I go back towards the coach and the assistant coach says, I, I explained to the coach, like, what do you guys got? Okay, white, your team hit it out from behind, blue ball. And then his assistant coach is like, okay, why did it take so long? Like, it took like five seconds for us to go over there and say, you know, what we had. And I thought about it and I'm like, you know, I can let this slide. I can just talk to the coach about it, but I'm like, screw it. I'm like, bench warning, you know, like put it in the book. You're not, you know, you're not going to talk to us like that. And now the rest of the game went beautifully. Listen, I'm never going to argue with a bench warning or a technical foul unless, like, we totally misapply the rule or we're not hustling up the court or we're showing, like, an ego. But I'm never going to say, oh, you shouldn't have given him a tech there because it's most of the times we we uh, we walk away from games saying, I should have given a tech there. I should have given a warning. We do that way, way too much. So, um uh, if you feel like that was appropriate in the moment, I might have used my words there. I might have said, Coach, one voice from your bench. Your assistant's mm-hmm. starting to be impatient. 
<laughs> I may throw that impatient line. I may not, but I like to just one voice from your bench. Assistant coaches have no leverage to speak about calls unless it's to us in a respectful manner during the timeout. Besides Amen, that, brother. there's no communication. Amen, man. Well, thanks for coming, man. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Jay Shep. Hey, Jay. Some coaches try to take advantage of the warning rule. They'll deliberately say something disrespectful because they are expecting to get a warning instead of a tech. Well, Jay, Jay, we've spoken about you giving technical fouls. Let's make sure we don't avoid them, but they'll deliberately say something disrespectful because they're expecting to get a warning. Okay, well, too bad, then that's a technical foul. Uh, I don't understand. Could you could you unmute and give me some context here? More context? Oh, yeah, uh, I had a play earlier this year where coach was like, uh, he said, I think we called a foul. And then he went to the scores table. He was like, uh, it's supposed to be six fouls instead of seven. And then the visiting coach said something else. He was like, hey, you have the referees and the table on your side. And I heard him say it. And I was just went, I went straight technical foul. I was like, okay. Yes, Jay. <laughs> I'm proud of you, Jay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I don't really give technical fouls. It's like, you know, my threshold is pretty wide. Yeah, but, now yeah, but you got it. Yeah. But we got to work on you with that line that you just said because you're holding yourself back, and that's not a line you're going to say as you gain more experience. I understand. Well, we've probably said that a lot, and I've talked to you about my friends saying it, and you know them changing their mindset about that. But we we. We can't be emotional about any calls. So whether it's a tech or a legal screen, it's like, or three seconds. Don't don't say, I'm not calling three seconds. Same thing. Don't say, I'm not going to call a technical foul. Because we want to get plays right. And if we're missing technical fouls, we're missing calls. And yeah, technical so that, fouls that's what I mean. call. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because he, like, right after the play, we had a free throw. He was, he was like, he missed the ref. Uh, did the rules change? Like, don't you have to give me a warning? I was like, I don't have to give you a warning. You know what I'm saying? It, it is a rule that says there's a warning. There is a warning rule, but I don't have to give you a warning. You know? So, yeah. Yeah, that's what made me, like, realize, okay, he said that because he felt like, okay, I, I'm just going to get a warning. He's not going to take me out. He's just going to give me a warning. Well, that was um, him acting on bad information. That's not our fault. That's That's, a, that's on him. We can't control that, their mindset there. As hard as it is, we have to be emotionless when giving a technical foul. It's just another call. Don't break your fingers giving a T. Yeah, it should be just calm, composed, just another call. Just where thick skin comes in, into it and that just uh, that emotional toughness. Nobody can penetrate my walls. You know, coach can say the worst thing about my family and I will not be offended. I just want to let you got that sink in. And I love my family a lot. They can say anything they want. Now, I know that's not realistic. They won't do that. But I'm giving you the whole other side of the spectrum of how you can try to, of why people get upset. Talk, like mom jokes, right? You can talk about my mom. I'm not going to get upset. Now, I know that's not a common response. Most people immediately activate and put up their defenses and defend their mom. I don't have to defend my mom. She lives four hours away. She's very safe. She's perfectly safe. <laughs> so uh, just figured I, I would share that. But um, no, this is great. Anything else uh, I can answer for anybody? I know it's pretty active in the, in the comments right now. Um, Sam wanted to know if you'll get a copy. Yeah, we'll get we'll get you guys a copy of the PDF. I'll share some of the rapid responses episodes. And also rapid responses is um, a reoccurring session. So what we did tonight is a reoccurring session um, that we're continuing to update. So this will be episode 11. But our mentor group actually does rapid responses about every other month. Um, so we're going to continue to build onto this series. And just to give you guys a little bit more info and a couple of people on the call tonight are from our mentor group. Um, I'll give you the short version. We have 250 officials from around the world that are part of our mentor group on all levels from first year refs to um, actually the age range is 14. We just had a 14 year old sign up today 
all the way to 65. So it really covers every part, every type of official from first year refs to varsity refs to division three, division two. We have a lot of division one refs. We have an NBA ref in our group. We have college basketball players that are also refs. We got former college basketball players. We have veterans that just want to stay sharp, stay connected, stay tapped into officiating. We have um, moms, we have grandmoms. So that's why we, we say Crown Rest family a lot because we're just a family of officials that love officiating. So I think anybody on the call who's interested in possibly joining, there's four questions I would ask you to, to gauge your interest. Number one, are you a great person? If you can answer yes, that's awesome. Number two, do you love officiating? Number three, do you love being part of a team and love helping others? And then number four, have you appreciated and been impacted by Crown Rest content? I think those are the four main questions that everybody shares that has joined our community. And that's why we have such a strong connection because it starts with being a great person. And we're only bringing in great people with no ego. There's no negativity. It's just a very positive, supportive place um, for officials. And, you know, we meet every week for live calls. We do two live calls a week, whether it's on Zoom or a voice call. Um, so there's just so much content going on. We have a library of content on Patreon, which I put all of my long form um, content on. Like It's kind of like my new YouTube. YouTube now is just like my short clips. I don't put any really long videos on there. So Patreon has all of our long form content, our shows, series, vlogs. Every episode of the podcast comes out on Patreon. And then we also have a Discord, which is another app that allows us to all communicate. Um, with one another it's a communication app like slack or whatsapp and we cover every part of the game on discord on 36 different channels every channel is a topic and we communicate in those channels so we have a communication channel game management partnering mindset signaling channel um, a, uh, a new member channel where we introduce all the new members there's a camps channel i know there's not a lot of camp information Really, Philly Rep is the only one that shares it nationally, and we're starting to build up that uh, that database of camps on our channel. I mean, people are posting links, applications every day. Um, we have a women's only channel, which is locked for the men. I'm really proud of that. We have over 30 women that are part of our, our team. So anybody interested uh, in joining our community, you can, you can reach out to me directly um, through email. I like to meet everybody that wants to join. Um, that's why we built such an organic community because I meet every single person that joins. We spend, you know, a half hour on the phone together so I can find out how to serve you best and how we can help you the most. So, uh, anybody interested can email me at crownrest at Gmail. Um, I'll put my number, I'll actually put my phone number through the chat right now. If you guys want to text me, hit me up, store my number. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Hey, Paul, bigger question is. <clears throat> are you going to make a trip to Wisconsin in June? Oh, Brian, I haven't given you my final answer yet. So I don't, <laughs> don't want to lead you. I don't want to lead you on, but it's, um, it's on the radar. I'm, I am, um, determining no. my uh, camp schedule. It's, and it's finishing up right now. I don't want to say yes or no, but I, I it's, it's. So it's like the chance. movie, like the movie, dumb and dumber. <laughs> so you're telling me I got a chance. <laughs> yeah. You definitely got a chance. Definitely got the chance. All right. Um, I'll, I'll, how, how, what's my deadline? I got it. I got it. What's my deadline? I, ha I haven't really given you one. I just kind of, you know, okay. I just kind of know I'm going to keep bringing it up every once in a yeah, while. Yeah, you should. You should. Yep. You should. Yeah. Until you give me a warning. Until you give me a bench warning. <laughs> Never. There's a good chance I, I may come to Wisconsin. So I'll definitely uh, keep you posted there. But I appreciate everybody coming on. Thank you so much. I hope you guys were able to take some stuff away and go apply it to your games. And Paul, can you stay on for about five minutes so I can show you that play? Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a I'm great night. Right now. Cool. Thank you, guys. Uh, stop okay. recording. I'll plug it in. Thank you. Upstairs. Okay.